thank you so much, Margaret, for taking time to be with me today. And I just have a few questions I want to ask you about your life as an activist, starting back in your youth. Can you talk about any events or beliefs that in your youth led you to become an activist? From a really early age, I just was like a natural organizer. I don't know, people would come to me in my neighborhood, my friends would like knock on my door whenever they had problems, and I would help them out the same thing kind of at school. And I think I just always wanted to be doing something positive. And that just followed through my whole life. And so, you know, starting as a high schooler in the 1970s, and the whole anti nuclear movement, I got really interested kind of in that. That was my first protest was a big anti nuclear protest in Washington, DC. My whole life, I've looked for ways that I could have an impact of some sort. I also worked <laughs> during college. So that was, you know, a little bit difficult. But yeah, in, it was like a community action coalition that I joined in college. That was also the anti apartheid movement. So there was, you know, a lot going on around that. I volunteered at a free clinic in Washington, DC, because I knew I was interested in medicine and, you know, and just was involved in, yeah, activities activities on my campus and in Washington, D.C. during college. I mean, even during medical school, there was a van that drove around in the wintertime to give out uh, tokens and try to help people without housing to find shelter for the night. We gave out food. I also volunteered at a, a local uh, kitchen for people without you know, housing and you know, or people just who needed food. And, you know, so even during my medical school, I was trying to find ways in Baltimore that I could be involved in the community. Like my growing up family, I think I'm the youngest of five children, particularly my sisters, my two older sisters were always kind of involved in, in trying to do positive things. And, and so I, I guess maybe, you know, tagging along with them and learning from them. My mother was also very involved in the community in a number of ways. But then kind of when I got married and started having my children, one that really propelled me into stronger activism, I think part because of my experiences practicing medicine in this environment and seeing how it really is all about profit and not health, but also the climate crisis and wars and so many things that I saw that were going to be impacting my children's future. And I felt a real responsibility to try to do something about that. But the, honestly, the community I lived in wasn't a good fit for me. <laughs> you know, people weren't really aware of the issues. And so I left that community and moved into Baltimore city. You know, I think that's one thing that's really important about activism is you find people that are positive influences in your life, people that you can work with and collaborate with and try to create some meaningful change with. And that's really important both on a personal level, but also on a broader level of having an impact on what's happening. So I don't think people should be afraid to seek out those kinds of communities. What continues to motivate you to be an activist? What guides you? What gives you courage? I think what kind of guides me and gives me courage is seeing the bigger picture, that this is really about uh, social transformation. This is something that people have been seeking throughout history. And so I see myself as part of like this, this wave <laughs> that you know, has come before me and will continue after me. And I'm just trying to be part of that wave to, to push things forward because I see that things are changing. You know, we are the kind of social consciousness is changing. You know, people are finding ways to get active and have, a, you know, and have an impact. And so what keeps me going is seeing that, you know, yes, we can actually make a difference. And even if we don't always see exactly those results in our lifetime, but sometimes we do, you know, some we are seeing some things we, as part of our campaigns at Popular you know, Resistance, we were able to take on these big corporations and stop the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Uh, we were able to win net neutrality in 2015, and, and now that continues to be fought, but that's, that's ongoing. The support for a national improved Medicare for all growing tremendously. And there's a lot more conversation about an understanding, I think, about, you know, what are the problems driving the crises that we have? I mean, I remember 10 or so years ago when I would criticize capitalism, people said, oh, no, you can't go there. You can't talk about capitalism. And now it's a very commonly recognized fact that the capitalist economic structures is really one of the root causes of many of the crises that we face. And people are looking for alternatives to that. So I, that's inspiring to me. I think it's important to have that long view so that you don't get frustrated because it does take a long time to, to win some of these victories. I'm not a Democrat or a Republican. And so Trump basically was revealing what 
is the reality in our country under whether it's under a Democratic administration or a Republican administration. At least he was like honest about it. Yeah, I just finished a, a piece on the current escalation of aggression on Syria and how under a Democratic administration, and we saw the same thing under the Obama administration, these you know so-called progressives are applauding Biden's bombing and intervention in Syria. And so I, I feel like the Democrats are more effective in some ways at the things that they do because people will just kind of go along with it and not be willing to criticize them or even, you know, apologize, make excuses for what they're doing. At least during the Trump administration, people, you know, got out there and and protested it. And we need to continue doing that no matter who's in office because both major parties don't have our interests or the interests of the rest of the world really at heart. The reality, but it can change. You know, I've been to places where they've they've taken this on and and they've, you know, they're creating really amazing new ways of having their society. You talked about being in Nicaragua. Can you talk a little bit about what that was like? Yeah, I just got back from Nicaragua about a week ago. I was there for a little over two weeks on a delegation. It was our first delegation as part of a new coalition called Sanctions Kill, where we're trying to bring awareness of the U.S.'s economic war on countries, which is now impacting a third of the global population. And this economic war that the U.S. is waging is actually illegal. It uh, goes against international law and is particularly targeting global South countries, especially those that are not willing to be under the thumb of the you know, U.S.'s foreign policy. And so Nicaragua is one of those that had a revolution in 1979, overthrew a U.S.-backed dictator, and since then has been working to build a new society. Of course, in the 80s, the U.S. punished them for their independence by waging the Contra War. And then the 1990s to 2006, they actually had neoliberal leadership in power. During that time, they had to kind of defend the gains that they made. But now that they've got, you know, their major revolutionary party back in power, the Sandinista front, they are making tremendous gains just since 2007. It's more than 95 and maybe 98% of the country, it's a poor, you know, mostly rural country, has electricity and water coming to their homes, like even up in the mountains and these remote communities, they've got running water and power. Most of their power is made from renewable resources. They have free education all the way through higher education and they very strongly believe in education and work to get youth again, even from like rural and indigenous communities into the education system. They have universal health care that's completely free. I benefited from that when I was down there and and our delegation got sick. And even again, in in these rural communities, they have health centers and they can get to the towns where there are hospitals if, if they need it. Economic empowerment of women is a very high priority for them as well as having women in leadership and political leadership. Women have programs that they can go to for education and are encouraged to get college degrees and open their own businesses. And and most of their economy is small businesses, cooperatives, a lot of farming. They produce 90 percent of the food that they consume and they're very proud of that, and it's organic. It's a real cooperative society down there that prioritizes human rights and empowerment of youth and women, because they see that's the future. So yeah, it was really great to be there. And it's a beautiful country. Um, So what advice do you have for youth activists, for young people? Well, I think that it's important to a number of things. I mean, one is recognize that you have power. You have the ability to make a change in your community. It, It doesn't take a huge number of people. Even a small group of people can have an impact. And don't let anybody tell you that you don't have power or you're too young to make a change. Uh, you're not, if you know, and I think that every single person can contribute to society in a positive way. And it's important for you to find out what it is that interests you, what, what drives you, what excites you, what skills do you have that you want to use, that you enjoy using, and how can you plug those into having an impact in your community, look for other people around you that care about the same thing. I think it's really easy to get down because there are so many crises that we're facing. And the best way to kind of deal with that in my experience is to find those people and find something that you're passionate about and focus on that and making a change and having an impact in that way. And I think the last thing is something that my partner Kevin Zeese and I always talked about was 
finding the positive on so every situation, things can go wrong. And, and he would always say, you know, you're going to fail and fail and fail and fail until you finally succeed. No matter what happens, we would always try to look for something positive and then build on that as opposed to allowing the negatives to just start piling on you and, and pushing you down is, you know, find that one or two things that, that are positive in the situation and, and start to build on those and, and build, you know, what we would call positive spirals out of that instead of going into a, a negative spiral. And they're there and, and you can find them. That's how you move forward. That's how we progress. Yeah. And it works, you know, when you do that and positive draws, you know, other people to you. They want to feel good about what's going on, about what they're doing. It doesn't mean to be unrealistic. I mean, we, I'm completely realistic about what we're up against, but I also look at the history of how people have made change. And I recognize that things change only when we put the effort into it. So put that effort. And I think one thing theme that came up over and over as we were in Nicaragua and learning about their revolutionary process and the work they're doing now was the concept of revolutionary discipline and the fact that things don't just happen. You, you have to be disciplined. You need to educate yourself. You need to apply yourself and, and then you can make a difference. Thank you so much, Margaret. I really appreciate your talking with me and taking the time. It's been a great conversation. Thank you.